Hey, everybody. Does anyone recognize this? Yeah. It's a favorite of mine. It's a piece of jewelry by Polish artist Eva Novak that can prevent a computer from recognizing your face. It was submitted for exhibition at the National Museum of China, but was rejected on political grounds. Why is this flashy face wear so political? Well, at Lutz Design Festival, Novak said that in Warsaw, due to an influx of pollution, people have taken to wearing smog masks. Isn't it rational that we're gonna protect our own bodies from the spread of facial recognition and police surveillance by covering our faces in the same way? Protesters in Hong Kong seem to think so, donning masks to protect against police detection. Facial recognition and technologies like it are descending on cities around the world like a smog, but the implications are much more dire. It's these implications that keep me up at night. You see, I study international data privacy and security. I've been guided by mentors at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and will soon be joining the Citizen Lab over at the University of Toronto as a cybersecurity fellow. At Fletcher, I study how law enforcement agencies all around the world are adopting AI-enhanced policing technologies and what the implications of that might be. My time at Fletcher has been crucial because it's allowed me to see this issue from an international perspective because the spread of facial recognition isn't just happening in Hong Kong. It's happening in your backyard. Now, as you all know, technology has spread to every corner of our society. And as it's spread, our ability to collect, correlate, and make sense of huge amounts of data has skyrocketed, whether that's our phones sending our location to Uber, or our fridge tracking when our milk goes bad. Our devices are, incre are increasingly networked together. The number of times that you open your garage door each day may seem innocent enough, but that same information could be used by someone to say, determine when you're at home. Our information can be used in ways that we might not expect and for reasons we're not comfortable with. This is especially true of biometric data, which is information about your body. Your voice, your fingerprints, your DNA, the contours of your veins underneath your skin, your tattoos, all of this can be used to uniquely identify you. For decades, scientists have jumped on this, creating unique algorithms that can recognize you by the unique contours of your face. Now this started small with controlled data sets, static images, and good old fashioned algorithms. But as these algorithms improved and computation power increased, this changed. Scientists began to question how they could mimic the functioning of a human brain with a machine. Artificial neural networks were the result. These replicate neurons in the form of nodes, each with their own parameters. And a group of these nodes can take an input, say an image, and break it into its different parts and look at each one of those individually based upon the parameters that it has. Now, by running an image through a train network, it's able to classify it as one thing or another. In this case, there's a 90% chance that this is a good boy. <laughs> now, neural networks can be shallow or deep depending on the number of layers that they have, and you can mix and match their structure to accomplish different things. But in 2014, a team over at Facebook developed DeepFace, which uses a nine layer deep learning algorithm to classify faces and identify them with an accuracy close to that of a human. These numbers are crazy. Now, on top of this, this te technology is able to recognize individuals from live video feed in real time. And this technology is spreading like wildfire because of its ability to be easily grafted onto existing surveillance systems. Now, from a law enforcement perspective, technology that allows them to draw upon biometric data is incredibly useful. Law enforcement around the world are historically underfunded and understaffed. For them, this allows them to do their job faster and cheaper. Now, it's easy to think of how governments might use this for bad reasons, whether that's identifying individual protesters in Hong Kong or surveying entire populations, like what's happening in Xinjiang province in China or Jammu and Kashmir in India. What's more insidious and harder to think about is how this technology might be used for good reasons, like at a border crossing, or to open your phone, but might have serious implications. Claire Garvey and her band of misfits over at the Georgetown Law Center for Privacy and Technology have been covering how this dynamic is playing out in cities around the world, in states around the country. 
What they found is that real-time surveillance can be conducted covertly and passively, drawing from huge databases, not just of mugshots, but in a lot of cases, passports and driver's licenses. Essentially, this can be carried out on law-abiding citizens without their consent or probable cause. What's more, this technology, because it's not perfect, can identify people, innocent people, as criminals, the rates of which are disproportionately high among communities of color. In 2015, the National Institute for Standards and Technology got it, <laughs> came out with a study of 189 different facial recognition algorithms. What they found is that these algorithms had a false positive rate of 10 to 100 times greater for faces of people of black and East Asian descent. This is crazy. It's a serious problem because your biometric data is incredibly difficult to change. If you lose your credit card, you can be mailed a new one and the old, become, the old one becomes invalid, right? But you can't change your face. On top of this, because this technology is either unregulated or regulated differently depending on where you are, it's hard to even figure out who the hell even has your face. Who's collecting this information? How are they doing it? Who's overseeing this process? And how do I get control over my data? Without sound regulation, these questions are hard to answer. Now, questions over what data governments can collect and how they can do it has traditionally been answered in courts and legislatures around the world. But these slow-moving mechanisms are adapting poorly to a technology that is global, highly varied, and spreading quickly. That being said, some groups are saying, hashtag press pause, stop the use of facial recognition software by government agencies. And in some states, legislators are taking notice. Last year, the California Senate voted to ban the use of facial recognition software in police body cams, citing concerns that it violated the Fourth Amendment, which protects you against unreasonable searches and seizures. The city of San Francisco followed suit, banning the use of facial recognition entirely by government agencies. The ACLU is leading the charge here in Massachusetts and this summer, Somerville became the second city in the United States to ban the use of facial recognition software in local investigations. I wasn't kidding. This is literally playing out in your backyard. Now, regardless of whether you think that an all-out ban is the right solution, I think we can all agree that having no solution at all is even worse. In 2015, a group of 100 tough students gathered to protest cuts in the number of janitorial staff on campus. They gathered outside of Baloo Hall and marched down to Powder Square, but on the way, they were met with Somerville police. Four of those students were arrested and charged with disorderly conduct. Now, when I first read about this story, I was reminded of Chris Wilson, who Claire Garvey introduces in her study. Chris was a classics major at the University of South Florida when she and three friends were arrested at the Florida State Fair while protesting its treatment of black students. A year before the Tufts protests, a 14-year-old boy, Andrew Joseph, was thrown from the Florida State Fair and killed by a passing car. Chris and her friends were commemorating his death when they were arrested and charged with trespassing. Now, the charges against them were dropped, but it's likely Chris's mugshot was added to two separate facial recognition databases, one operated by the FBI and the other by the Pinellas, State, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. These databases are searched thousands of times every year by hundreds of different local, state, and federal officials. Now, I don't know whether the same thing happened to those tough students, but I know that to do so would have been legal in Somerville until last year. It's crazy to think that standing up for something you, that you believe in can land you on a police watch list indefinitely. Like it or not, this is an issue that you confront every time you walk across campus. Miles Platt, looking at you, Miles, wrote a great article in the Tufts Observer talking about the spread of Tufts security camera system over the last five years. What he points out is that the SMFA campus alone has over 40 cameras peppered on the inside and outside of the building. There's cameras all across campus, whether that's the science and engineering complex and the Kindle Van Cafe, Coho, and soon the Cummings Multidisciplinary Study Center. Some people have said that this gives them an added sense of security but others have said that it's a violation of their privacy and have, in some cases, requested that the cameras be taken down. What do you think? Regardless of whether you demand an all-out ban of facial recognition or whether you think that this isn't something that has to do with you, you should know the limits of your own privacy. 
its erosion by technology is something that touches us all. You should know the limits of your privacy and whether you want to take steps to protect it because more often than not, our privacy is something we take for granted until it's gone. Thanks, everybody.